The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, and with that, I think we'll be ready to start on lecture seven. Not really a lecture, we're just talking about lessons from uh, the sprint tournament. And you could whine and complain about the map set, and I would totally support you, because that map set was crazy. So I'm just going to have a seat here, and I'll bring up this little uh, Word document that I've got, where we're going to talk about a few aspects of maps, a few aspects of teams. So let's, uh, let's, zoom, let's zoom right on in. So map-dependent stuff, which is, which is written here. So we, we saw a bunch of stuff that really killed a bunch of teams. Like we had mines in the way of spawn. Make sure you check that you, know, you don't try to spawn a unit on top of a mine. That's another thing. If a unit is on top of a mine for whatever reason, he should probably try to move. Uh, in previous years, we've had spawn delays so that when a unit is spawned, it can't move for a certain number of rounds. But not this year. He can move immediately. So if you're on top of a mine, and you have a hit point number x, and the round, the defuse time is y, and you know, the number of rounds it would take to kill you with the mine dealing damage z, you just do the math and see whether it's worthwhile to try to defuse it. Because you, know, you can't have multiple units defuse the mine on different rounds. It doesn't like continue defusion progress. So anyway, they'll just die. And we saw some real hero mines that have been promoted to Supreme Commander. Um, and they're now commanding fleets in the Pacific. The, uh, another thing was encampments. So sometimes the encampments block off other things. I mean, certainly we saw a lot of teams lose because they built encampments around their base and couldn't get out. Like, OK, so it seems like a dumb thing when you're looking at it, but how do you check for it in the code? Like, what's the best way? I mean, it would be obvious to just try to maintain a diagonal line straight from you to the enemy and never lay bases on that line. But maybe there's like, that's the only base. So I don't know exactly what the best way around that kind of problem is. The, uh, yeah, so they can, the encampments can sort of block each other off, or you can block off the enemy. Um, we've, we saw some of them, like you couldn't get to those other ones. Let's see if I can open up that map. Oh gosh, what are the chances I'm going to be able to? No, the chances are zero. Yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it in paint, because it's just a general idea. This was one of the maps that I did design. Uh, I didn't design all of them. This was the one that looked like, um, oh, I guess I, guess, I guess I can just use continual lines. Oh, man, this is going to be great. This is going to be great. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it was just like that. And then the encampments were arranged uh, a little bit like this. This, uh, yeah, yeah, it was like this. These were the encampments, and they were connected this way. So there was a pretty short rust dis 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 dance between team A and B. So team A and B were there. We had uh, hero mines H and H that would uh, kill entire armies. Um, actually, they, they, I I'd said that they went on to be supreme commanders in the Pacific, but then they were subsequently arrested for war crimes um, and executed. But their descendants live on. The map's still there. So there you have it, You know the cycle of life and history. So anyway, the point that I was trying to make before I sort of confused myself here was that B would go ahead and build a bunch of encampments, and then he wouldn't be able to get to like these ones back here. He couldn't get to them because they were not, you know, he, he, could, he couldn't find them. So that's, that's definitely something to worry about. Like if, maybe, maybe what you should do is say, no, I'm just sort of speaking off the top of my head here, is if you can't get there and you're a robot and you're like trying to path around them, maybe you should like send a signal to this fellow that he should suicide and then like the team should remember from now on into the future of time that they shouldn't try to build something there. And then maybe that'll be like the new route to the expansion of new colonies and exploring space for the benefit of humanity. So we see that they can be blocked off. Don't know exactly how to fix that problem. Um, we saw other issues like, uh, like, like team, team Zero or 116. They shouted attack, and they died at round 2002. That was too sad. Um, th I have the match here, and it was like they were cut off, and maybe that, that was an exception. So definitely want to like look for exceptions that will take place if you're cut off. And maybe just like communicate to the other bases, hey, I'm cut off. Please uh, kill yourself. Um, and I'm sure they'll comply. Like, luckily, battle code is not like the actual world, where it would be really hard to make that argument to them. They're like, yeah, but 
but it's me. I, I, I've, heard, uh, I've heard a little bit about rush distance. We had one map that was called something like, uh, I don't remember what it was called, but we kept calling it bad ideas, where it, the map was like this. Uh, it was, oh man, that, that map was fantastic. I, was, I didn't make this one. It had a big minefield in the middle, and then there was uh, A and B located here. And then on the very edges of the map, there were, there were encampments, like in these corners. And so the idea was that if you actually take some of your, like you're pretty close here. This distance was, I don't know, 15 or something. And so if you would send your guys out in this way, by the time you built the encampment, like first of all, you're losing soldiers. Second, you, they're not going to help you defend. The enemy's just going to go ahead and kill you. So like if you see this distance, I mean, I think a decent set of heuristics for a map should be the following. Like, like here's, here's like map, map heuristics. I think that you could say like distance to enemy and uh, distance to closest encampment and encampment and then you could do uh, I guess that's like that's pretty much all you need because I think distance to enemy is kind of kind of unimportant what you should do is like number of mines to the enemy and that sort of encapsulates distance and so then you could be like, OK, if this distance is big and this number is small, then there you go. So all you got to do is say, like, uh, that number minus that number. And now you're starting to have like, something that you can compare to, like, if, it's big, if this quantity is greater than some number, then do something. Anyway, you guys get the idea. We had a couple of maps where we had lanes next to the mines. I think we do that quite a bit. Like some of the maps that we gave you initially, you could just walk straight to the enemy if you path around the mines. And the lanes weren't that complicated. Like, uh, like all you have to do is make one little turn, and then you're going straight to the enemy all the way. And we saw some teams use this, but we also saw them put encampments on the lanes, and then they couldn't walk there. I think there was one very critical map, uh, one very critical match, and that match went something like this. Oh, are, are some of you obsessive compulsive? You're getting a little bit annoyed by these little bits? OK, there you go. I think on the map that I'm describing, it had these lanes like this. And so these are the mines that I'm drawing. And then between those, we saw the encampments that you could capture. So I'm just going to make it slightly more symmetrical. We had team A over here and team B over here. Uh, and the teams were just like lined up exactly with the mines, so that if you counted the mines directly between you and the enemy, it was a large number. But if you counted this number, it was a zero number. So what Team A started doing, and I'll just recap because not all of you will have seen that match, is they started like defusing these mines this way, but simultaneously they were capturing encampments. So I I believe they were they like didn't think that there was a straight path to the enemy, because whenever they captured something, they also like they also got these as soon as possible, so they could never really get around. And uh, simultaneously, B was building up a minefield and uh, and researching nuke. Uh, yeah, nukes for the win. <laughs> so I think it was it was pretty weird. You know, we we ended up seeing. I guess I guess you could classify it as almost three strategies. We you know there was there's a rush, there's an econ strategy, and then there's a nuke strategy. Like these are, I, th there's overlap of course, but th it almost seems like there are three strategies. In this map, for this particular map, we saw that Econ, which was his building these encampments, like if he didn't build those, he would have gone straight to the enemy. It would have been great. This Econ strategy was defeated by the nuke. So I'm just going to do an arrow. You know, Econ on a large map would kill a rush, and on a, you know, and on a small map, a rush would kill a nuke. Like, this, is this rock, paper, scissors? No. But like, given a map set, it can be rock, paper, scissors E. It can be scissors E. Anyway, the point is, the point is that whenever we have something like this, uh, you know, if you're not taking into account the map so that so it's just like pick it at random, then one result that you get is that the tournament can like not make sense. And I think a lot of you, and that's like very, it's it's more than just like some simple uh, you know concept in your head that the tournament isn't making sense. Like because because the, the basis of a tournament is that when it's done, you know who's the best, right? It, it's supposed to be that like teams are they've got like a fundamental goodness and that the top ne top team is best. But if you have three teams, rock paper and scissor, and you hold the tournament, 
what is the what's the point of the tournament? The, there's no, you're not going to find anything out at the end. And of course, you all know this. Um, and and if you feel it very, and my point is that you feel it so viscerally when it ends up happening. So the only solution is to use that map data and to say, okay, I know it's a short map, or I know it's a long, ma a large map, or something along those lines. That's the only thing that you got to do. And I'm I'm very confident that we're going to see a whole lot of that in the following matches. Uh, not in the ones we're going to watch today, in the ones that are going to be submitted to the su subsequent tournaments. So we saw the lanes next to the mines. Um, we saw some really good positioning of artillery. Uh, the, it made the difference between victory and loss in a lot of cases. And I'd like to point out, especially in the presence of my simulator here, that a, a little artillery can go a long way. So I don't know how many of you have had a chance to look at the latest update of my battle code simulator, but it works the following way. So here I'm going to compare two strategies. This strategy is to build robots and no, and can't, no generators or suppliers. And this strategy is just to continue building. Uh, two stands for a supplier. So there you can see the first strategy is in green. How does that show up? That shows up pretty well. The first strategy in green is to just build the soldiers and you hit the maximum. And then the second strategy here, you can see now in this updated version of this battle code simulator that you actually do lose some units. Uh, you lose units that you would have had. Those soldiers are destroyed in capturing the encampments. And then you only pay it off later. So here you see the 150 rounds or so between you know, starting to buy those things and having it pay off. And you can similarly see that you know, that round number is going to change. Like If you only build two of these things, it's going to be quite different. And well, I guess it ends up paying off at about the same time. That's curious. That's pretty curious. But I'm sure, I'm sure it has a, its basis in fact. Let's, uh, let's just double check here. The, supplier, uh, the supplier, suppliers do reduce your spawn delay. So here on the left, I've provided a table. And this is all available on the internet. So you don't need Mathematica, because I did, I did also save this as a PDF. But you can make this yourself uh, in Microsoft Excel or something like that, where you see the number of suppliers on the left, like uh, you know, going from zero up, up on through to some incredibly large number, which we did see in this tournament. I, if you guys saw, I really love to watch some of those macro games. And then we see on the old spec what the spawn delay would have been, and then the latest spec. So the spec used to be 10 times 0.95 to the n, where n is the number of suppliers. The latest spec is 100 divided by 10 plus n. So the effect is that now, with the latest spawn delay, we go down from 10 faster. So you see here we're at 6 when it, the old one was at 7. But later on, we're higher. So we, we sort of uh, level off much sooner. And so we're at 2 here when the other one's at 1. So there's a, there's a crossover, and it's sort of favoring getting them earlier. Anyway, my point is we can go with number of suppliers and a spawn delay. So when I get one supplier, I should see a spawn delay of that improves by one. And so you can say, like, OK, the, the headquarters is producing hit points per round. Like, that's the point of the headquarters. I mean, sure, number of units is a different metric than number of hit points, because units deal damage, not hit points. But you, it's sort of similar, because you're dealing damage and taking damage. And you know, there you go. It's all a question of micro when you get right down to it. It's all very clear and straightforward. So hit points per round is four. If you build a single artillery, like, OK, you build, you build a single supplier. Now your spawn delay is nine. So you're producing 4.4 repeating hit points per round. So that's an additional 0.4 repeating hit points per round. That's what you got out of building that supplier. You got this. And the next one you build will get you this. I mean, if you build this one, you get even more. I mean, some of them that you build don't get you anything. So you can see like incremental hit points per round. But look, all these numbers, none of them are that big. Whereas if you got something like an artillery, it, it can get you a large number of hit points per round. Because really, what you're interested in is not just hit points for your team. It's the difference between your team and the enemy hit team hit points. So if you build artillery that does get shots off, I mean, like you can, if it shoots all the time, then it's going to be dealing 40 damage every 20 turns. And that's like infinity, isn't it? That's 40, uh, 40 over, that's two hit points per turn. That's, that's a lot. I mean, of course, it's not going to do that because a lot of the time it isn't shooting. But if it's shooting only like 20% of the time, then it's 2 times 1 fifth, and now you have 0.4. So it's starting to be competitive to get an artillery compared to a supplier. So that's just one way of looking at things. Definitely worth thinking about, I, I should say, because you know one of these artilleries can be, as we've seen in some of these matches, worth its weight. So now the question is, 
is this code working properly? And I think the answer is no, actually, in, in characteristic fashion. So here I've built one supplier, and the production rate of robots is approximately identical to the way that it was. So I'm just going to debug this a, a second. Let's see here. I think, uh, I think we have here. OK, so that's the supplier number there. And the question is, if that supplier number is there, and the spawn time is being updated, then why wouldn't it take effect? Because that certainly does look like the latest spec. Well, in any case, I think, I think it would be safe for us just to start with one, and that's like a decent fudge factor. Let's, let's do that. Let's start, with, let's start with, oh my god, I'm terrible. Terrible person. Let's see, uh, let's see it happen. I'll figure it out later. So there, now we see a little bit of a difference, and we get the second one should have, OK, that had a big effect. Was it supposed to? It was. The third one should have no effect. So let's, let's just double check that. And then what we're going to end up doing is we'll watch some matches. OK, so let's go back to having two. And now we'll go to having three. And yeah, the slope didn't change. I don't think the slope changed. It just moved left and right because we had to lose another soldier. So that's good. I think it was just an offset of one. Um, I guess that makes perfect sense to me for some reason. Yeah, I'll understand it. In fact, let's pretend I understand it now. Uh, it's just a question of when we're pretending I'm not understanding it, not a question of whether. All right. So let's go ahead and watch some matches because I really want to illustrate a few interesting things about mines and micro and so on. So let's go. Um, all of you can do it. I don't know if you've seen this, but you simply go to tournaments and you go to results and you click on sprint bracket. And now you have access to all the matches that you can download. I mean, it's not as great as like being able to, uh, for example, get everybody else's code so you can play against it infinitely. But it's pretty good. And you can also uh, convert this match data into XML files that you can parse to like find matches that match a certain characteristic. Like for instance, uh, let's just do an example. Uh, I guess we'll just pick any random match. Let's pick the final, the final match. Oh, I don't know. The final match was, was I mean, what, I think what ended up happening is we started having teams that rushed uh, get to the finals. And I think that was map dependent. In the future, it may be less so that rush teams are really making it up to the finals. And there may be other, like an econ team. Like we see one of the best econ teams here, hey, I just met you, was actually a cross between rush and econ. We saw them sometimes build like absolutely massive numbers of, of, uh, of macro buildings. And other times, we saw them not. I see one question. Yeah, are you talking about Mr. Pipe Nexus? Uh, Mr. Pipe Nexus? Oh, best of five matches. Um, that's been introduced as a concept. Uh, sorry about my misunderstanding. Best of five matches may be introduced later, but it's still on the table because it's, uh, it, it would require a large reworking of our, of our tournament code because, of course, we write things in the most flexible and reusable way possible. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think they do. Let's, uh, we can actually go straight into a match and just double check that. Because all we have to do is go to one of those matches where one of the teams walls itself in and just look at that because then they have suppliers but not, but not soldiers. So let's go to that one. I think I have it loaded already. Uh, those, poor, those poor fellows. Yeah, these, I'm sorry, Team Zero. I'm sorry. But here you go. They have a supplier and they are Team 116. And they're steady at 225 resources, whereas that, I don't know, is that, is that more than they would be spending if they were doing nothing? I think, I think it might be. There's a, chan there's a chance that it, that it could be. I'm going to go with yes. But that's sort of a, a guess. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It probably is. It probably takes upkeep. I, I guess that's another thing that may be wrong with my simulator. Anyway, I'm tired of saying that I'm wrong. Let's talk about how I'm right. Come on. Come on, guys. All right, so let's open up a match. I, I want to start before, you know, before teams that are rushing are winning. So like Citizen Snips, for example, I think was doing some decent, rush, uh, some decent macro. So let's open that one up. I think I was pretty impressed with that team. Um, there were also some teams that were brand new, like that, that came from the bottom of the ladder. And I think we'll have a chance today to talk about those a little bit as well. So I'm just going to make sure that I'm looking at the latest, the latest one. Oh, man, please sort them. Would you mind sorting them, computer? Thank you. Man, I tell you, you know, there's a problem with insubordination these times. So yeah, we see we te te Team Snips on the right is getting Vision. You know, Vision was not a very popular upgrade, but they're building these artillery and the, uh, in the front, and then they're building supplier in the back. I think that's a, that's a, pretty, a pretty interesting approach. And because of the map layout, um, they're ending up using the artillery quite a bit. Like, so we see, we see a good shot there. It's not bad. It, it, does, uh, it does seem to deal some damage. 
No, it, does de it deals no damage to allied units, so that's great. But I think later on we might, we might see, yeah, that, I don't know if that was such a great shot, because we took out two enemies at the cost of two allied units, so I, I don't know, that seemed like breaking even in my eyes. But so, so there's something you can do there with writing artillery code to try to avoid allied units. Like, like maybe, I don't know, you shoot at, you could literally compute the value of every tile, but it seems pretty expensive. So I'm not sure exactly what the best way to do that is. So we see them getting vision, one of the rare teams to get vision, and we see them upgrading that interlaced with building their other robots and their other structures. So that, I don't, I don't know how I feel about interlacing one thing and another. So it's like, I guess, the idea is that it's not quite as fast as researching it straight out, but it's not quite as slow as like getting it after you get all your robots. But actually, when, when it comes right down to it, if you build, like, like, let's get out a simple program here, such as paint. Like, if you build four robots, like one, two, three, and four, and you research like 25%, which I'll indicate as like, maybe there's like a completion bar, and you research like, I don't know, this much, and then this much, and then this much, and then you're done. Like, how is that any different from research, from getting like robot, 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 and then getting out the full bar? I don't think it's incredibly different, and it may be just that it gives you more flexibility to make decisions part way. Because like, maybe if you do this thing, uh, which I should change the color here, like maybe if you get three of these straight out, then now you're sort of fixed and you can't finish this for a certain amount of time. Whereas here, you give yourself more flexibility to like cancel this part way through. But I just feel like this is the stronger move because if you, if you go up against this team versus that team, then if there's an engagement at time this time, then right then and there, you're gonna have four on three. And so when it comes down to here, you're gonna have like, you know, two guys left and he's gonna have one guy. And it's gonna be, you know, pretty clear who's gonna win. And it doesn't matter that both of you have the stuff at the end. It's just not, it's just not gonna matter. So I, I don't know how I feel about the interlacing. So we see a bunch of that. Uh, and we also see here that, you know, Team 70 is a team that either rushes or goes for a heavy macro play. And I get the feeling that on this map, they've, dis they've decided that the rush distance, like the distance from one team to the other, is not huge. It's not that big. And so, and there aren't that many mines either. So I think this is the reason why they're doing this rush. For, for, you know, I think it's pretty impressive that even though they're down on units, like pretty, con pretty often we see two units from blue and one unit from red. Nevertheless, red is able to like hold off this, this, uh, this blue attack. I think, I think uh, Team 70 uh, has some really excellent micro. And I will remind you that the um, Team 70 has one author who was a former uh, member of a team with Corey who spoke yesterday at lecture. And you remember that Corey talked all about micro, micro being the important thing that wins matches. We're gonna see that again and again. You saw that in the sprint tournament, and I have ways of indicating again to you in videos that we watched today that that was incredibly key in a lot of circumstances. Uh, we saw that happen, and so it makes perfect sense that we would see Red have some really good micro. But at the same time, like he's not gonna make any inroads against this player who's doing artillery. And you gotta wonder whether that's detectable, like whether he can tell that he's dying to artillery and whether he can like tell the main base, hey, you know, this is artillery, so we've got basically two choices. One, we, we bunch up a lot of units and we make sure we attack all at once and spread out enough so that we're not taking splash damage from that artillery, or we gotta get shields, or we gotta do a massive econ play. Like basically we got those three choices and one of the, neither of those choices, neither of those three are among the choice of just simply sending one unit at a time. So I think a lot, that, that was, see, did you see that happen? That's pretty surprising. Like you, you, see, you see the enemy attack and you see red outnumbered. So like this is two enemies to one red, okay? And the two enemies are sort of like grouping around the enemy headquarters because they're not really prioritizing attacking that one red guy. They're sort of just going toward like the enemy, it seems. It's not, I mean, it's not that obvious that they're prioritizing enemy units. So what ends up happening is this one red guy is managing to kite and attack only one blue guy. See that? And I guess there's probably like awesome stuff that you could read in their indicator strings here. Like remember that when we show the tournament, the indicator string bar is not there. Like uh, that's just not part of the tournament viewer. But if you watch the replay, you can read their indicator strings and you might learn something about what those robots are trying to think about or trying to do. So here you see the red is like really kiting these guys and he's almost using his headquarters as like 
a defensive structure. Like you can see here, he's almost come back because he's got two units and this guy's capturing an encampment and you can't cancel that. So he's almost like recovering here uh, and just through the use of micro. I think it's very impressive and it's only because he sort of walks into that artillery fire again that it seems like he has, he has some trouble. I mean, I, I, there are multiple ways of reading the system, uh, you know, reading what happened in this match. But, um, but I think that was, that was pretty interesting. This is like one of the only shields that we ever see. I don't see any reason why Blue would have decided to build it, especially in this location, especially given this guy has no artillery, especially, especially, especially. So I, yeah, I think this game's pretty much foregone, but you know, uh, and I think this one is also a foregone conclusion. Okay, here's a great example. <laughs> so he's, he has built three suppliers. Okay, three suppliers out of Team 216. And there you go, he has 180. Whereas at the beginning, I think you were stable at 194. So there we have our definitive answer to that question. I think you are stable at 194, so these do take hit point, uh, they do take an upkeep, these, these supplier units that he does end up building. So that's, that's good, that makes me feel happy. So now it goes on to a round three. I mean, yeah, I, you, gotta, you gotta check that. Okay, said it before, don't wanna repeat myself, very good. So team 70. Team 70, both teams are deciding this is a macro map. Pretty interesting, because once again, we saw Team 70 not do macro. But look at this, look at it. He's not running straight for macro. He's got this decision in mind. That's one generator and four suppliers. Wow, let's, let's just rewind just, a, rewind just a little bit. Just a little bit right over there. So yeah, he's getting the generator first and then those three. Meanwhile, he's getting, uh, he's getting fusion. He's already got fusion. And I think he, he prioritizes that upgrade. Like, it's pretty strange because you see him, I think, get it before even his first unit. So here we're looking at round 20. Round 15, 16, 17, he still hasn't built a unit, whereas Blue has built two units already. You know, it's questionable whether prioritizing fusion is gonna be that good, because he, he prioritizes fusion, but then doesn't actually use all that energy. He's still at 1600. You know, does he ever actually use it? Maybe, you know, it's, it's gonna be later, and it's, you know, this team could be even more powerful than it was, perhaps, if it, perhaps did that a little bit later. So yeah, let's, let's go back and let's think about this because this setup here is, is meant to sort of strike at a certain time. And the time when he's meant to strike, like imagine, imagine setting it up this way where you're like, okay, I know that depending on the number of macro buildings I build, that will give me an attack timing where it'll be the perfect moment for, you to, for me to attack because I'm just running out of resources, I'm just hitting a peak of units. Well, maybe that attack timing should exactly match how long I estimate it will take for me to get to the enemy. Now, you could use the headquarters to say, you know, to just calculate explicitly, it will take me this long to get to the enemy. I had better have some macro up by that time. And, you know, that could be exactly what he's doing. So let's do a little check in Mathematica where we'll say he's going to build uh, uh, four of these suppliers and he's going to build one generator. So there we see that he's going to cross over and he's going to be even with the enemy at 200. So let's hope that he attacks the enemy closer to 300. Let's see what happens. So there, he's just pausing. Like all his units are pausing. It's round 269. They're not doing anything. It's round 300. They're still not doing anything. I guess it's because he's taking more bases that he's decided like, okay, I have, I have something that's a lot of units. I'm pretty sure this is a defensive move that he's just gonna move out here and he's expecting these to defend him. Unfortunately, you know, that's not exactly on the midpoint between the two armies. And you gotta wonder whether that's a deliberate idea or whether he's chosen to go in this direction for some other reason because we're gonna see Blue go ahead and take out a lot of those bases, that, a lot of that stuff that he had on the bottom. So we see once again, these, that, that Red ha ends up using and does in most of his matches, he ends up using his reinforcing stream as a, defensive, as a defensive tool. If he didn't have that stream of units continually coming out of the base, there's no way he would be able to defend this because these guys are not programmed to turn around and come back. Once again, Blue has this great, like look at this positioning. I think it's, it's probably not just great positioning, it's probably just that every other time he's building one or the other because we see another artillery here and here and here and here and here, whereas you know, Red has not built a single artillery. So the question is, you know, is, it, uh, is it the building of one thing or another that has made the difference in this match? Because we're starting to see, like, Red is starting to get a lot more units uh, and that artillery is not always shooting. So, it's, I think it's a pretty open question whether it was actually worth it because in this long match, it ends up being that red prevails. So, yeah, that's, I mean, it, it's pretty interesting how red has got like a relatively simple move. He's just like picking rush or econ. And when he goes econ, he goes econ all the way. And when he goes rush, he goes rush all the way. And his micro is fantastic. And those little things alone, uh, <laughs> little though I may call them, are, you know, are really significant. Okay, so that's spending a long time on just one match. Um,
let's look a little bit about let's look a little bit at Game of Death. Game of Death is a team that started out really low. So let's see here, Game of Death. So we can click on them here under Battlecode Teams. We see that they were 13 and 3. The ranking was at the bottom of the scrimmage of the scrimmage ranks. So let's have a look at how they made it up to round four from the very bottom round. Like they had a bad, they had a bad match, a bad seed at the beginning, and they made it all the way up to here. How were they able to do that? Because they must be doing something right. This is a, you know, like what's this turnaround? Let's let's have a look at this. So I'm going to go over here, going to run that match, and I'm pretty sure we'll have time to talk about all of the interesting things that happen in this one and in the next ones. So here on the right, we have uh, we have that team, that new team, uh, which has been you know which is upsetting one after another other team, and he's going to build suppliers. So he's built two suppliers, and he's building a few mines around the headquarters, and it looks like he's just rolling over Team 172, which was which was Drunkosaurus. Drunkosaurus is another one of these rush players, and you'd expect a rush to be pretty effective on this map. So what happened? I think it's worth mentioning that. You know, a rush player would do well to get like if you're if this rush player is not really pathing around mines, if that's not the way that they're planning to play the game, then they probably ought to get defusion. Uh, I mean, they've spent a few a, a few rounds buying fusion. Doesn't seem to make that much sense to me. I think you might get like one free round at the beginning. It seems like a lot of people will just put one point into something, but you know, the amount of time it takes him to get to the enemy, he can compute. Because he, he just went straight there. So he can compute that time. And he can say, all right, was that worth it? Um, it's also worth mentioning that I think in a lot of these engagements, he's busy defusing mines during combat. And like we said before, you can't attack while you're defusing a mine. So like the, part of the best reason of getting defusion is so that you only have five rounds of inaction. So that like, let's say you, you, nobody's around. It's perfectly safe, great time to defuse a mine. So you start defusing that mine. Now you see the enemy. You can't cancel the defusion process. So if you were going to do a 12 turn defusion and you see the enemy and he's at a distance of, wait, what's the distance? All we have to do is look it up. So let's go to my uh, useful specs document, which is neither handy nor dandy. It's, it's in fact much more serious and much more useful than both of those terms would suggest. So range 14 is your sight range. You, have, you can see a unit that's three tiles away. I can zoom in a little bit more here. It's rastered, so it looks kind of silly. I always think it's interesting how when you raster something, sometimes it becomes orange on one side and blue on the other side. I'm sure some of you in this room understand it, and I'm sure that not, some of you in this room don't care to understand it and never want to. So he's three units away, right? The enemy's three units away, and you just started defusing the, the round before. So if that's a 12-round defusion, then by the time he gets to you, you've still got like seven or nine rounds left if you subtract correctly and depending on the turn counts and whatever. That's a lot of time that you're just going to spend doing nothing. And how long does it take for the enemy to kill you? They deal six damage per round. You have 40 hit points. I can't divide, but that sounds like sort of seven-ish. Seven rounds? Well, look at that. So you had 12. You didn't see anybody. They had time to approach and kill you and go away before you finished. Like, that's really lousy. Uh, even if they get one hit off on you, that's going to make a huge difference because this is a knife edge game. It's, an, it's a game of instabilities because we don't start you off with like a command center that deals damage, for example. We don't give you that many defensive advantages. So as soon as the enemy gets like a couple more units than you, it's just going to start pushing in that direction unless they start making mistakes. So that's one of the reasons why like defusing a mine with, without defusion and without vision is a problem. Let's say you have both vision and defusion. I mean, of course, they're very expensive upgrades, but let's say that you've got them. Well, now it's only going to take five rounds to defuse something, and you have you can see a unit that's uh, uh, five tiles away. So let's say he's over here. You don't see him. You start defusing. Now he's starting to show up, and he's moving toward you. By the time he gets there, you're done defusing, and you can start shooting. That's pretty. That's a that's a pretty big difference. And I think that's one of the reasons why we see a lot of successful rush teams go ahead and get that defusion. Whereas we see Drunkosaurus here not getting defusion. You know, we see decent micro on both teams' side. I don't know. I don't know exactly if this is good micro coming out of both. There's certainly had a, mo a lot of motion going on. Uh, you know, it's 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 sort of anybody's guess. Here, both teams are defusing mines. They're just sort of like watching each other. Maybe they're, you know, they're, they're sort of playing Parcheesi with the mine defusion, exchanging tips on how not to get blown up. Um, it's it's very. I think it's a very odd thing to see. I think it's it's quite strange, uh, but but yeah yeah the point has been made the point the point has been abundantly made. 
Another thing, if you're retreating and you are adjacent to the enemy, I think we've seen this a lot, and I think that is kind of what's going on in some of these cases, like, like maybe this guy is adjacent to the enemy and maybe he's retreating because he's, like really, he's got one energon, he's like, get me the hell out of here. I think he's like maybe or was trying to retreat at some point, but it's a bad idea to defuse a mine when you're adjacent to the enemy. Like, don't start. Don't, just don't start. It's like smoking. Just don't start. Um, yes, this advertisement brought to you by the American Society for Lungs. I don't know. I, I just thought that sounded right. So yeah, here once again, we see this is the same two players. Uh, but in this case, blue team just, I don't know, he's like dancing or something. It's not, it's not super effective. He's building nukes. Like somehow he's decided like, yeah, now is the time to get nukes. <laughs> like I've gotten pickaxe, but I'm not using it. So I think, but no, uh, to, be, to be fair, I think what he's trying to do is like lay a bunch of mines into a minefield. And he's doing that using his pickaxe. But I think maybe he's thinking, all right, there's a lot of neutral mines. These are supposed to help me out. I shouldn't destroy them. But, uh, but nevertheless, you know, the red team is able, to, you know, is able to just roll this over. So it does go on to a third, a third match. But like, what a difference. What a difference we see here. Without, so you know, he's getting close to his maximum. But we see he's, he's optimized for this. Look at his units. He's using 500 bytecodes. That's effectively zero. So he's going to be able to get up to the full 40 units. And that's going to, you know, that, that, what, that strength of that 40 units. What is the strength point of that 40 units? Well, let's simply go back here. Uh, to here, to here, that that 400 like that 400 round counter, that's exactly that's exactly when you hit your maximum if you haven't built any upgrades, and that's exactly when he arrives at the enemy base. So unless we start changing the maps, you know, not getting upgrades is going to be fine for you as long as you know as long as you're not doing what he did in the last round, uh, which was somehow bad. I mean, you got to have that clump of units. And I think one thing that we see again and again is once a team loses its clump of units, it sends them in one by one. Now, it's not obvious that that's a bad idea, because we've seen teams win that way. So what do you do? OK, now that was pretty one-sided. What happened there? What, did blue have more units, or did red have more units? OK, let's go and say this is 3 by 5. So that's 15 units, because these three go into it. And that's 18. So that's 18 units. This is 3 by 5 with 3 missing, so that's 15 units. Plus, OK, so that's 18, 19, 20. So this guy's got 20. And I guess that counts for these guys that blue left behind. So red's got a slight advantage. All teams are, are, are defusing mines. These two could be fighting. There's no reason for them not to be fighting. Now red has, red has managed to kill this guy off very handily because of that advantage. We, we saw before in Corey's lecture how he's talking about this being a very unstable situation, where if you've got one gap between the two, the person who closes that gap first will win. So let's see if somebody is going to close that gap. Well, now look at, look at how much damage blue is doing. Like, that, that's pretty impressive. And I think part of that is we're seeing that a lot of red's units are just spending time defusing. This one and this one in particular. Also this one, which is right in the middle. Uh, these three in the back, definitely not ones to ignore. So yeah, blue ends up coming in here and capitalizes on a little advantage. Now red, OK, red is still attacking. Like, at this, like there's, there's a point in this battle. One of the things about battles is that you know where the enemy is, right? So you can, you can make that count. You can count them. You can say, all right, we're about to lose this battle. Here's an interesting question for you. You're losing a battle. What do you do? Do you call for reinforcements and say, OK, if we have more reinforcements, we won't lose as badly? Or do you say to the reinforcements, please go back to the base and regroup. It's your only chance to live. You know, what, what, is, what is what you say? Look, I mean, I don't think we have, I'm, I'm hitting the B button. There's no broadcast going on in the whole map. But you could imagine the case where they would be like, OK, I'm telling my allies, get the hell out of there. So, and this guy, this guy, so like, he sees a very bad situation. And here, he's two, tiles away from, he's two tiles away from an enemy. He's got the choice. Like, do I move, close that gap? I mean, that's a bad idea, right? From Corey's lecture, you don't close a gap of two, because then you won't have the attack advantage. That's not a good idea. But what's he going to do? So let's click on it. Oh, look at that, he moved in. And what's he going to do again? Oh, he's, well, he's kiting a little bit well. He's only fighting one of the enemy. That's not so bad. But he ends up being destroyed. I mean, what can he expect? I think it would be very reasonable for you to write code that says, OK, if the enemy is there, what am I going to do? A lot of times we've seen teams back away. They try to do a retreat. Of course, a retreat doesn't work if you're already engaged. Let's say you're not engaged. OK, we're smart people. We don't retreat when we're engaged. That, that would be a bad idea. You know, we, we keep with it. We have our commitment. But we back, we back out. Where do we back out? We've seen teams time and again try to back away, and then they get stuck because there's mines in the way. Like They only cleared a very narrow path through to the enemy. 
So why not remember the path that you took to get to that enemy so that you can then just follow that backwards? Like you have omnidirectional view, so that might work. It might not, it might be a terrible idea, but I'm just putting it at, putting it out there because you can save map locations pretty easily, like to to an array. And then it's like, okay, just pop that array back. So you're like pushing to an array, and then you're popping the array values back. So it's like, you know, its own ordered list of where I've been and where I want to go back to and you know what I want to do with my life and whether I want to visit Paris and eat baguettes. So it's like a full integrated system um, for, for traveling the world. And I, I think Red could definitely benefit from that, especially in a case like this. I mean, would he, would he be able to come back from this? Probably no. I mean, just a little bit of macro from Blue, I think, ends up making a huge difference. But, uh, but nevertheless, it's worth, it's worth mentioning. So like, why does, why does Red not win this map? We've seen Rush, Rush teams do well. I think it's, it's just because Blue actually built any units at all. But, you know, there you have it, there you have it. Good game, that's a good game. Let's make sure that we're getting to everything. Getting to everything. So we've seen, we've seen some games where we had a run around, where one team would run around, uh, would sort of circumvent the other team and deal damage to the headquarters. As we've said before, the win condition is as follows. You know, we, I don't think we've been that straightforward on what the win conditions are. First and foremost, it's headquarter hit points. So if you can get one hit off the enemy, that's a good time to just back out. You know, maybe, maybe the time now is to just lay some mines and play defensively. As long as you have registered a hit on the enemy head, headquarters, which you could like, let's say you're, if your soldier moves toward the enemy headquarters and is adjacent, that's a nice time for him to broadcast, hey, I was adjacent to the enemy headquarters. Ergo, I did damage to him. That's like, that's a given. That's always true. Unless the enemy has a med bay adjacent to his headquarters, Dealing damage, no, that's not going to work. Head ba well, there you go, there you go, folks. You've heard it from the words of somebody knowledgeable. <laughs> um, so yeah, so th there you go. So you would know. So you could you could message and you could play defensively. Headquarter hit points first and foremost. Number of encampments second. Number of mines third. Number of robots third. Fourth. Good one. Uh, yes, yeah, so we saw some runarounds. We saw we saw some teams running around the enemy, and. We've also seen, like, a, like, especially at the lower levels of the bracket, if your headquarters is under attack, it is of paramount importance, tantamount to paramount importance, that you come back and defend it. Definitely worth sending a signal. You know, allied soldiers, either protect me or, you know, just declare yourselves null and void and you're not going to get a Christmas bonus. So like, like I said before, you know, Game of Death was a great team. Uh, we, saw, we saw them get really far. Velociraptors, Drunkosaurus, and Cordage, we saw them rush and be very effective with that. You know, there are ways of making a rush more effective. We saw them do those things, and I think it was very impressive. Um, we saw Soda, which was a really good team. Uh, they, did, they did well in the newbie tournament last, last year, and I'm excited to see them back again this year. Um, there were certain things they didn't do that were kind of strange, you know, and a lot of teams here probably felt that they could have done better. You know, these little edge cases end up being so important. Like on little forts, they're standing right next to the enemy. This was so sad. They're standing right next to the enemy while the enemy researches nuke, and they're like surrounding them. They've got tons of units, but they just didn't move in. I mean, there's, there's a certain like state machine code, maybe a couple of mines, maybe they had indigestion. There was, there was clearly a good reason there, but they just didn't do it. And, you know, checking for those edge cases is, is just so hard to do. I, I think this is all going to be so cleared up, though. We're going to see some great stuff. Um, hey, I just met you. Again, we saw their, their sort of bipolar uh, response to maps. And I thought that was, that, that was just fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Um, I want to I finish, uh, finish by talking a little bit about sort of the way the game might change in the future. So, you know, the, you saw certain specs and you saw certain maps. This is the kind of thing that we change after the sprint tournament or the seeding tournament where we go, okay, we want to tweak this a little to make sure the game is interesting. Like, that's, that's, our, big, that's our big focus. Like, we want the game to be interesting. We don't want it to be random. We want it, we want it to showcase how amazing you guys are. So if it ends up being the case that rushes are the best and that, like, a little bit of microcode makes a difference between winning and losing 100% of the time, like that, I don't think that's that great. I don't like that. So let's say that there could be changes. Now, if, when you hear that, you probably go, aha, he's going to tell me the changes that are going to happen, but he's not allowed to tell me the changes, so he's going to tell them hypothetically, but they will actually happen. But no, that's not the case. I'm just coming up with them hypothetically. I guarantee it. <laughs> OK, so the, the changes are, OK, we got a nuke. The nuke is 400 rounds. OK, 
we have, we have maximum, the maximum soldier count uh, for a rush is at 400 rounds. We've seen that, like using my Mathematica simulator, we've seen it with soldiers. I'm sure you've written it, you've wrote, written it yourself. I mean, it's, it's technically 200 rounds if you're, if you're you, you know, computing digits of pi. Yeah, because as, as we've said before, that, that would mean that you have a whole lot less uh, to have. So that's, 200, that's 400 rounds, that's 400 rounds. Uh, the, minimum, the minimum distance between headquarters is 10. The maximum distance between headquarters is, I think we said it was 200 rounds of walking mining. I think that's what we said it was. So it's not, so in the current set, you're not going to get a map that's like this, that's like 400 on the side, or I think the maximum we said is 70. So if it were 70 on a side, then there would be exactly 70 mines between you and the enemy times five rounds per mine is 350. So like that's the absolute worst, worst, worst that it could possibly be, and that would look like this. Like that would be all gray, full of mines, and that's just not going to happen. Like realistically, realistically, we're going to put in like some silly path, and you can just walk there. Uh, so so with the current spec, the point that I'm trying to make, I mean, okay, you could add you could add 25 because it'll take you a little bit of time to research diffusion, so you can get to the other side. But my point is that this is only 350. Like, and, and so you're really only going to have 200 rounds of walking. And the, the fact is that we don't want to get that close to that number. So we end up like 99% of the time, right now, we're making it like 100 rounds of walking. Wait, that's actually too much, right? Because you do this for five rounds, and then you move, right? Uh, OK, sure. So it's six. It's six. Very good. So that's a six. And that's a 420 plus 25 equals ugly. No, it's a four, four I, I don't know, it, it's ugly. You made my diagram ugly. You know what? I'd rather be correct and beautiful. I mean, oh, I can't have both? OK, so anyway, you get the, my poor diagram. I knew you well. Yeah, so there you go. So you, just looking at these numbers here, you can add them up, and you get like 730, and it doesn't mean anything. No, I'm, ki I'm kidding. You can see these numbers, like they just don't make sense for econ strategies. They just don't make sense. So what we might do, and what I've been telling the others I would like to do, is set nuke to like 600. Let's say nuke were 600. This can stay at 4. Like it doesn't matter what things are in absolute terms. It matters what they are compared to other terms. Uh, so so the soldier rush. Okay, let's keep that 400. The nuke is 600. Let's make the maximum distance like 300. So now these are changing. These are changing at the same rate. The nuke and the distance are changing at the same rate, so nukes will be no more favored. What will be favored is like now, now soldiers are like, now it's farther to get to the enemy. And you still have the same number of, like you have maybe a smaller number of soldiers relative to what the other guy has. So this would favor econ. Like if we increase nuke and the distance, then that'll favor an econ strategy. And so then I think we'll start to see uh, some more interesting games where there's like just a couple more encampments being taken. And you know, this competition is moving in wonderful directions, and it's moving that way uh, under the fiery engines of your spirit. Thank you for attending the last lecture, and I'll be around here for questions afterward.